Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. This evening's show is part of our Legislative Issues series hosted by Jim Parisi. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the continuing saga of the Central Coventry Fire District, the budget issues that they've had, and how those uh, issues have impacted the residents in that fire district as well as the workers who work for the Central Coventry Fire District. And we're pleased to have Paul Valletta with us this evening. Paul, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. Paul is a firefighter, long-term firefighter in Cranston where he's also a local union president and he is a legislative agent for the Rhode Island State Association of Firefighters. Paul, this uh, issue of Central Coventry really has taken on a life of its own. Why don't you start by uh, letting our viewers know what is the Central Coventry Fire District? Well, the Central Coventry, and I've, I've learned a lot about fire districts in the last six months that I never knew, knew about because uh, I, I come from a city department. But the Central Coventry Fire District is uh, one of four districts in the town of Coventry. Um, each are, uh, have their own tax base, uh, they're their own entity, really, and uh, this problem stemmed from a uh, vote for the budget uh, that was not passed by the by the voters, and subsequently the things that have gone on and, and what we're trying to accomplish uh, to keep these firefighters uh, working and keep the central uh, the uh, citizens of Central Coventry uh, protected. So different from places like Cranston, where you work, Johnston, where I live, or Providence, where the fire department is part of city government. That's not true for the whole state, is it? Right, no, it isn't. Uh, and shame on me, but uh, I didn't know this. There are, there are 44 fire districts in the, in the state of Rhode Island, a lot of fire districts. Mm -hmm. um, in many of the towns, there are, there are multiple fire districts. Um, so so there's, there's been much talk during this, uh, this problem of, of combining those districts, and, uh, and that's, that's been the topic, one of the topics in, in Coventry. Um, which we can get into a little later. Um, but you're correct, they're, they're much different from city fire departments. Uh, they're on their own, they have their own tax base, uh, they collect their own taxes, uh, they're not part of any, any city budget. So when you get into that problem, maybe towards the end of the year, where there's uh, a one line item that, that's less and you can borrow from another city area, a, a city budget, um, you, you can't do that in a fire district. They're, they're on their own and, and that's the budget they go by. So Central Coventry Fire District is obviously the central part of that town. About how many houses or residents uh, are covered by this fire district? Well, Coventry uh, has about 35,000 residents, um, and the Central Coventry is, uh, is the biggest. Uh, they, they cover about um, 21,000. They, they have about 21,000 in, in their population. Um, they, they cover the largest, uh, the largest population. Um, they don't have the largest area, that's uh, Western Coventry, but uh, Western Coventry Fire District only has 1,100 people that they service. Um, so the Central Coventry um, is a uh, pretty big area um, for this district to cover. And uh, you know, we're not talking about Mayberry here. We're talking about a lot of people. We're talking about a lot of area, um, schools, nursing homes, um, a five-story hotel, um, a National Guard Center. So uh, if, if this district were not, uh, didn't have the capabilities to respond with fire and, and rescue service, it, we, we've got a pretty serious public policy going on here. And you have members who work for this fire district, don't you? We do, we have uh, 51 members, uh, 51 union members that work up there. And uh, we also represent um, the Anthony Fire District, that's part of Coventry. And we also represent um, the, some of the members, the paid members, of the Hopkins Hill Fire Department. So three of the four fire districts, we have union members. And that's, 
you know, it's, it's been a, a pretty, uh, pretty tough issue for us up there, um, especially when the judge ordered the other three fire districts to come up with a contingency plan. You know, now you're, you're, pitting, you're pitting union people um, that uh, may have to take over a district where union firefighters lose their job. Uh, the judge had no choice to do that. He, for public safety, he had to try and put a contingency plan together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a, it's been a tough, uh, tough six months up there. Right. So continuing on the, this theme of just getting some background information for people not familiar with fire districts, uh, f final question on size. How many, how many firehouses, uh, you know, companies, engines, what, what kind of information do you have for our viewers to get a sense on how big this Well, Central is? Coventry, uh, let me just uh, go to my square mile notes because I don't know, but Central Coventry covers 28 square miles. Um, they had five fire stations and they were staffed uh, with uh, 10 firefighters, minimum staffing of 10. Um, Anthony covers 5.5, they have 9,000 population, they have one station with four firefighters on duty at all times. Um, Hopkins Hill is two square miles uh, with 3,000 population, they have one firefighter on duty at all times. And Western Coventry with 28.4 square miles has one firefighter on duty at all times. So even if Central Coventry were to stay in place, you could see the amount of firefighters that cover that area. It still isn't a big amount of, of firefighters there. Yeah, it sounds it. And and does the fire district perform more than just fire services? Does rescue also operated by seven, Central Coventry? Yes, uh, all all the fire districts, um, those fire districts all have rescue service. Except Central Coventry is the only of the only one of the four districts that has a full time fire uh, fire rescue service. Um, the other three have rescues, but it's called what, what's called cross-manned. So they don't have manpower specific for that rescue. So if a call comes in prior to a rescue call, if it's an engine or a ladder run, that's the truck they take, and then the rescue's out of service for the other three stations. So Central Coventry, uh, which is very important, has the only full-time rescue service in the town of Coventry. So this isn't only an issue of fire protection, it's health and safety of the sure, residents and, and as they, well. Sure, uh, and they run uh, a hazmat team. Uh, they cover Johnson's Pond, which is uh, 2.8 square miles of water. And uh, we all know on, in, during the summer months, uh, it's, it's very crowded on Johnson's Pond. Uh, they've made several rescues out there. Um, so yeah, this is a real, uh, real serious uh, safety issue that we have going on here. Okay, so now let's talk about the financial problems of the district. Uh, w how is their budget set? You said that this fire district has its own taxing authority. How, how is that tax rate set and who actually runs the, the fire district? Well, there was a, there was a fire board in place, um, a, fire, a fire commission, fire board, and um, what happened is uh, every, every year when the contract, or not every year, every three years when the contract's up, the, the board will sit down with the union negotiate a contract, much like a mayor does, or a town, uh, you know, a town manager does in, in a city or town. And then that budget, is, that budget is brought back to the, to the people to vote for it. I, I guess you could call it the ultimate in democracy, although it hasn't, we've seen where it hasn't worked that well here. But um, anything that's done uh, budget-wise or contract-wise has to be voted on by the people in Coventry. So the budget is set. Uh, they have an annual meeting around October. The folks come in, and if they vote the budget in, it's fine. If they vote it out, which happened this time, it didn't pass. Um, that's where we got into the problem because there isn't uh, the same the same language for cities and towns where if the budget doesn't pass, the old one stays in place. That's not the point with fire districts. That's not the issue. There was never that language. So once this budget failed, there was no budget in place. And that's the language that uh, we're trying to work on now. And then once that happened, there were no tax bills that could be sent out. And that's how we got into the, the financial problem we were. Th th if I quickly, th there was a problem beforehand. No one's saying there wasn't a problem in Central Coventry. Um, there, was some, uh, there was some issues that, that have been brought up that, that have been cleared up now by the special master. Um, there was a, uh, an excess of a $700,000 tax mistake made for three years in a row on one single property that was carried over in revenue. The money never disappeared because the money was never there, but it was carried over into revenue that they were gonna get that they never got. So there are issues in Coventry that need to be cleared up. Um, the board has resigned at the request of the judge. The judge didn't force them to resign because he found um, that there was no evidence that there was uh, anything malicious done by the board. 
But um, to get everybody together on the same page, he asked the board to resign. New board would be elected. He said those old board members could run if they want. Um, they did all resign because everybody wants this to, uh, to work. So this saga started a while ago. Was it, was it the fall of last year that yes. the voters first turned down a budget? That's correct. Well, the, the first budget only lost by 24 votes. Um, and then they did a, a revised budget, and, and there was a bigger number that came out for that. Um, but yeah, this has been going on for quite a while now. And, and when the budget failed, it's not only a budget, it's also the ability to raise taxes Correct. through property. Right, the tax, the tax bills don't go out, and, and that's what happened. Uh, the district actually ran out of money um, a few months back, and the, the firefighters had to work without pay, which they did for five weeks. Yeah, I recalled uh, reading about that. Yeah. That was a significant sacrifice from your members. That was a tremendous sacrifice for our members. Uh, I, I guess it proved that uh, they, they didn't really want to walk off the job. Um, and you know, not to sound corny or dramatic, but you know, when you're when you're a firefighter or a police officer, um, you know, you get uh, you get a sense of pride for the department you work for and the city that you protect. Um, much like teachers, I mean, my brother's a school teacher, and I know he takes unbelievable pride in his school. And um, you know, that's just your job. You do it long enough, you get this feeling of you know you want to make it work. And uh, yeah, they stayed on the job uh, for five weeks without pay, and. Um, that they finally did get paid, although they've only got their base salaries for those for those uh, weeks they were out. Uh, many of them are still owed thousands and thousands of dollars that they've they've put off um, to get this to get through this problem. So, since the tax bills didn't go out from the fall, who's been running this fire district, and how are they funded? Well, when that happened, the uh, the superior court um, put in place a special master, uh, much like a receiver. Um, and that's the other problem with fire districts. They get caught between, um, they, they're not part of a federal, they can't be part of a federal bankruptcy. And they weren't included in the language that uh, was put in a couple of years ago, um, or last legislative session for uh, putting in receivers and, and overseers and mm -hmm. things like that. So they were legisl legislatively left out of it and judicially left out of it. Uh, so the court uh, appointed a special master. Um, and, and Who's the special master for Richard Land, mm -hmm. and he's been running the district um, for the last six months now. Um, they did have, the judge did uh, order him, or not order him, he asked, and the judge uh, said he could send out the third quarter taxes, which got an influx of money in, um, which, which kept the firefighters on the job and kept the district open. Um, and now the fourth quarter taxes are due to go out this week. And when you said they were able to um, send out the tax bills, at what rate were, were, were those taxes set at? It was sent out at the original rate. Um, this fourth quarter tax that they're sending out will be sent out at a different rate. It's still the rate, it's still based on the budget that the people voted on a year and a half ago. That budget is still in place. Uh, the reason for the change is because um, fire districts are legislatively only able to tax on single tier. Um, Central Coventry and other fire districts, not just Central Coventry, they've been taxing at two tier, residential and commercial, which they can't. So the special master recognized that and uh, he would not send out a bill knowing he would be breaking the law. So he, he, re he sent it out on a single tax, um, which, did bring, the, which did, did bring the tax base up a little bit. So now they've got some money flowing in. There was a period of time where the workers weren't get paid, but they kept on working. Uh, are there still five fire stations open in the fire district? No, what happened is, um, not to get into specifics, because it hasn't been signed yet, but the firefighters have worked out an MOU with the special master, um, uh, giving back more concessions than they did earlier. So uh, that will be made public when it's signed. Um, but in the interim, uh, they've closed three of their five fire stations, and they've uh, reduced their minimum staffing from 10 to eight firefighters. And they, they've, uh, they've reduced, they haven't uh, pushed for more hiring. Uh, they're down about seven firefighters for the overall staffing. Um, so they're running short with the overall staffing, and now they're running two firefighters short on the minimum staffing. Sure. Which now brings us to legislation, because there's always a legislative angle to right. uh, shows we right. have. Uh, what legislation have you worked on on well, this issue? Representative Guthrie Tommaso and um, Serpa put in a bill um, as a stopgap right now. 
And that bill would, would put in language, like I said, the cities and towns have, that if the budget is not passed, the old one stays in effect. So we got that passed at the, the House and the Senate last week. It went into effect this, this week, which means now the tax bills can go out. That gives us a little leeway, uh, gives us the summer months to sit down with the special master, or the Central Coventry guys to sit down with the special master, and the new board, which uh, we actually have a hearing this week. The judge is going to allow an expedited election of the new board, we hope. Get this board in place of new people, sit down with the special master and the firefighters, and come up with a tax base that's acceptable to the, uh, to the citizens. Sure. So the legislation doesn't solve the problem. It just delays calamity, Correct. I guess, is one way to look this at it. This legislation doesn't. Uh, then uh, there is another bill going in this week, uh, sponsored by Representative Guthrie. Um, and it really puts in place safeguards that this can never happen again, what happened in Central Coventry. Not just the contract staying in place, but now there's mandatory audits that they have to do every year. And, you know, these are, these are big, bud not big budgets, I should say, compared to cities and towns, but Central Coventry is a $6 million budget. But they never had to do an audit, like cities and towns have to do. Now they'll have to do an, a, an annual audit, send it up to the State House, it can be reviewed. Um, now they'll be able to legally tax on the two-tiered system for residential and commercial. So there is legislation being introduced that will take care of Central Coventry, but also take care of the other fire districts so this never happens again. Yeah, I think a lot of residents would be interested in that, not knowing that there's some real protections for taxpayers in legislation and also protections for maintaining some kind of level of service for right and, and we want to see on. yeah we want to see that too as firefighters we really do this is I, I liken this to the pension issue um, we all know it wasn't our fault but we still took the brunt of it and this is the same thing here the firefighters in Central Coventry don't collect taxes they don't make the budgets up but they're the ones that had to work five weeks without pay and they're the ones who could be conceivably out of a job here mm -hmm. so we, we want these protections we don't want this ever to happen again anywhere you mentioned some representatives' names on taking a lead and at least getting through this stopgap measure. Um, How do you fare in the Senate on, on this issue? Not too good in the Senate. And, and you know, um, I got to give my, uh, I got to thank the, the Senate and the House um, for, for looking at this legislation. You know, it's tough when legis legislation's put in and the, uh, the people, the, the elected officials from those cities or towns don't support it. Um, you know, as a senator, you have to listen to those people and, and what their complaints are. Um, but uh, to their, you know, to their credit, they listened to everybody. And um, the, the Senate side, we couldn't get anybody to, uh, to uh, sponsor the bill. Meaning people from Coventry. People from Coventry, the Coventry uh, officials, um, a couple on the House side. Um, and the problem is they're just some people, some elected officials, that want these guys not to be there anymore. And there's been a lot of misinformation put out there, um, especially that there's a contingency plan in place. And I think if you listen to some of the people that went to court after the vote took place and the judge was thinking about liquidating them, um, they got up and told the judge if, if they knew that their vote meant that no budget meant liquidation and no fire service, they would have, you know, not that they were thrilled with the tax hike, but their vote would have been different. Um, and that was the big problem. There was so much misinformation put out on this Coventry Fire District. And the main thing was the contingency plan, that there was a plan in place that if these guys were liquidated, there would be fire and rescue service available. And that's just not the, that's, it's, there's still no plan in place today. Sure. Well, it's been a, a fascination, fascinating journey uh, just getting this far. Uh, it's terrific that you were able to work out a stopgap measure with the House and Senate leadership. Um, I think there's uh, yet a story to be told about how this works out for all the other fire districts in the state. So perhaps you'll come on the show again in the fall Certainly. and let us know what's going on on those issues. I will. Thank you. Okay. I thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. Have a good evening. Thank you, Danny, and congratulations, Tim, on an honor well deserved, especially given the current unemployment climate, which is unfairly and unnecessarily taking its toll on members of the trade unions, as you so aptly pointed out in your recent op-ed piece. Roy Colum, are you still here? Roy Colum, 
It's t take a bow. They, they did a terrific op-ed piece in the, uh, in the Providence Journal talking about that very issue. I hope everybody read it. The next award goes to a person whose tireless efforts on behalf of workers and all the citizens of our state have earned their numerous accolades. Here to present Sister B. Lanzi with another is our state senate president and our friend, the Honorable Teresa Piva Weed. Ladies, please come. To me. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening and the honor of presenting this award this evening to my friend and former colleague, uh, Senator B. Lindsay. For those of you that don't know, once a senator, always a senator. Um, but we do have um, a number of other members of the General Assembly with us tonight, so I'd like to take a moment. I think Senator Chacon and Senator Ruggiero have left, um, but Senator Miller is also here. And Senator Hannah Gallo is also here. Although in fair disclosure, this whole Cranston woman brigade over here, you have uh, <laughs> Andrea Iannazzi, B. Lindsay, and Hannah Gallo, it kind of all goes together. Um, I know all of you, or most of you, probably knew B's father, who founded the FLP in Cranston. But B has come to be a friend and a leader on behalf of labor in her own right. She served in the House for 10 years, and where I've really gotten to know her, of course, is serving in the Senate for the last 10 years. She has uh, been a champion for women's issues and children's issues but also for labor. Anyone who spent any time at the State House will tell you sitting on the Labor Committee for 10 years is not an easy feat. <laughs> and she has taken any number of very, very, very difficult vo votes and has received tremendous criticism during campaigns, you know, that she was just there to vote for labor. And she never shied away from it. In fact, just the opposite. B has always been very proud of her position and representing the working people of Rhode Island. She has consistently held that as a matter of pride. And it's something to be respected in a building where lots of times, I'll be very honest from you, there's a whole lot of people that are in hiding. Um, I want to mention also that what she does in her private position, uh, where she, she's actually the liaison at the United Way to the Labor Institute. And I'm sure that mo mo many of you know her in that capacity through the work that she does as the United Way. And through that capacity, labor does so much for our community, for our state, and that is in great part thanks to Bee's efforts. So thank you, Bee, for that role as well. <laughs> and finally, after all that talking about all the men in the labor movement, I just want to mention something. Francis Perkins was the first Secretary of Labor um, under Roosevelt, and it was she who really brought the labor movement and brought down, I think it was actually to a 10-hour working day, and children's labor laws. And in that very strong tradition of Francis Perkins, I'm proud to be able to present this award tonight to my friend, to my colleague, B. Lanzi. Well, I want to thank the Senate President very much uh, for being here tonight and giving me uh, this award. Uh, it really does mean a lot to me, and as she said, uh, I did serve in the House, but then when I went uh, over to the Senate and served in the Senate, it was like a whole new world, right? Uh, very different from the House. And uh, her leadership really sets the tone in the Senate, uh, an open leadership, a leadership where each member can really get involved in the issues that he or she feels is important to them and their community. Uh, the Senate President really allows each senator and really encourages each senator to grow, to represent their communities to the best of their capability. And uh, she really uh, sets the tone of professionalism 
and always openness and transparency throughout the Senate. And for that, I want to thank her, and it means a lot for me tonight to have her here with us. So, And it also means a lot for me to be here tonight to receive this award because I do come to this event every year. And it's always a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my boss, Tony Maioni from United Way, he and the rest of us at United Way usually come. And uh, we always enjoy the experience. Tonight, of course, it's uh, more special for me to be able to receive this award from people who I've worked with, people that I admire, people that have been my friends uh, for the last 20 years and it really uh, has been 20 years. It's gone by so fast, right? Uh, and just for the record, I was 12 when I was first elected. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, they say time goes by fast, and it really does, but I can tell you that it's been uh, such a rewarding experience for me to have served in elective office. Uh, it was really a humbling experience. I felt privileged. I enjoyed every moment of my service in office. And there were times that were challenging, and there were times that were difficult. Uh, but throughout it all, it was always a rewarding and humbling and enriching experience. But I will tell you one of the things that was really never difficult for me was to stand up on behalf of working families in Rhode Island. And as the Senate President noted, uh, many of you did know my dad, uh, Tom Lanzi, who uh, was a public servant, was a police officer, who served on the executive board of the AFL-CIO. And when he uh, was uh, with me in the early campaigns, uh, he would always stress to me uh, the values and remind me of those values that I was raised on, uh, making sure that uh, we work hard, making sure that we stand up for what's right, and making sure that we stand up for the rights of others. And although my father has uh, been uh, gone now for 16 years, and uh, also that seems like he was just sitting at one of these tables at one of these events, it seems like yesterday, but uh, he did pass away 16 years ago. But he was very involved in all of my early campaigns. And throughout my service, I, I would always hear him, and he would tell me that working families were relying upon me. So throughout all of my service, that was one thing that was never difficult for me. So tonight, uh, I would like to actually dedicate this award to him, uh, to Tom Lanzi, because uh, every time I took a vote, or I uh, said something in committee, or I drafted legislation, or I stood up on behalf of working families, I know that every single time he was standing there with me. So thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week, Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m. Malloy. I'm a professor at the Schmidt Labor Research Center at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, several weeks ago, we held our annual labor law conference. And as part of that day-long affair, uh, we had a, an hour-long panel uh, featuring several uh, labor leaders talking about 
uh, some of the legal problems uh, that they uh, uh, face in today's uh, environment, as well as some other things that uh, they wanted to get off their chest. And so today we're reprising uh, some of that, uh, so to speak, uh, with two of the panelists. Uh, unfortunately, Mike Sabatoni from uh, the Laborers Union couldn't be here, but we do have uh, in the House uh, Michael Downey, uh, who's uh, started out at URI uh, 28 years ago as a plumber, uh, worked his way up to become president of the AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 528. Boy, that's a mouthful. And uh, from there, he went on to become president of Council 94, which is the uh, headquarters, really, of all state workers uh, in Rhode Island. Uh, he's on the uh, board of directors of the Institute for Labor Studies uh, and on the executive board of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO and involved in a host of other things. Our other speaker today will be uh, Maureen Martin. Uh, she was a longtime employee uh, at the Ladd School, where she became president of AFSCME Local 1293. She was involved with many other people with the deinstitutionalization uh, of that facility many years ago. Uh, she was the political affairs person at the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and uh, Health Professionals. Uh, and uh, most importantly and uh, uh, impressively, uh, she was, is the first woman uh, to be elected a chief officer of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO, uh, currently the secretary treasurer of that uh, more than century old uh, organization. And so with that, let me turn it over to Mike, and uh, when they're done, we'll uh, summarize it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malloy, and uh, thank you for this opportunity here to talk about some of the problems confronting uh, working people in Rhode Island. Uh, <clears throat> when I first uh, started to think about the different problems that I've come uh, into since being president of the council, since 2005, there were, there were many to list, but I've highlighted a few of them. And one, and they're not in any order, but they all, uh, they all seem to fit the problems that we have representing workers here in Rhode Island. Uh, one is that public employees have become uh, the number one enemy in Rhode Island. Uh, everything that's wrong with Rhode Island seems to be blamed on the backs of the workers that I represent. And we know that's not true, and we're going about trying to prove to everyone that's true. Another issue that's confronting us is the pensions. I'm sure everybody's aware of all the pension debate that's going on. And now we're finding out that hundreds of thousands of dollars from people outside of Rhode Island were used in trying to bring about this so-called pension reform. As we speak, that uh, issue is uh, a gag order by a judge. And far be it for me to break any gag order mm -hmm. that was given by a judge. But I will tell you that uh, uh, my participation in those uh, mediations uh, leave uh, uh, the taste that it's going to be a long time process and uh, we'll be debating that I think for some time to come. Uh, <clears throat> we do want to keep an eye on uh, politicians. That was another one that comes to mind with us. We have often known in Council 94 as being a leader in uh, getting things done at the State House. Well, I'm here to tell you uh, here this evening that that's not necessarily true. The politicians, at least in my opinion on Rhode Island, have turned their backs on workers, especially workers that I represent, and that they've changed their pensions, they've taken away things we've negotiated, such as longevity and other items that we long time negotiated. So the politicians certainly uh, could use a little help in working with working people, and Council 94 is prepared to work on that issue. Privatization is another thing that affects many of the workers that we represent. Uh, it seems vogue nowadays to get rid of public employees and privatize them. It's usually done with the lowest paid people, janitorial services, uh, sanitation services. While I uh, support everybody having employment and being employed, one might want to think about uh, trying it with solicitors or management or some other groups other than people that do the day-to-day -day work. One huge item that we're wor working on and hope to work with everybody on that is unemployment. Unemployment in Rhode Island. Uh, is at least, I think, uh, under 10 percent or thereabouts. That's unacceptable. And all of us, public employees, private, everybody has to sit down and work on that. The issue that we've faced in Council 94 and other workers have faced, if everything else fails, if we can't take away everything they got, then the cities go bankrupt, such as what's happened in Central Falls. The one doesn't have to follow too much to know that they've spent more in a receivership than if they had just given Central Falls the money that they needed to carry on. Over $3 million or so has been spent with the receivers. 
and we fight that day in, day out. Contracts, we need to get away that when a contract ends, that we can continue to have discussions rather than lose everything we have. So in sitting down highlighting a couple of these items, uh, when Professor Malloy called on me and last week when we did this, uh, I came up with at least those ideas and some things, uh, we do have some answers to work on them, but I'll leave it at that for now and just list a couple of our ideas. Council 94 continues to organize the unorganized, and we believe that's a way that all workers in Rhode Island should be part of a union. And now that management's chasing us around, funny to say that we've been able to organize quite a few groups in the past two years. So we'll keep doing that, and uh, we'll keep working very hard to make workers have a place of dignity and respect in Rhode Island. Thank you, Mike. Maureen? So, um, you know, the AFL-CIO is uh, a little different than uh, AFSCME Council 94, for instance, which actually represents uh, employees. The AFL-CIO is kind of a, an umbrella organization for a multitude of labor unions here in Rhode Island, and um, we do a lot of support to all of our um, affiliates. We represent, um, through those folks, about 80,000 plus uh, workers in Rhode Island. And um, I thought I talked, I, I talked a little bit before about uh, how, how we support people through our electoral and our legislative uh, work. Electoral being that we work on um, various um, uh, campaigns in the election cycle and we look for labor-friendly, worker-friendly candidates. We push them through the system, and we've been in the last two election cycles quite effective, I think, um, electing both at the state level, the local level, and at the federal level, uh, candidates who are friendly to our members and who understand the, the mission of labor and uh, the plight of workers both unionized and, and those folks who um, haven't gotten the luxury of being uh, organized into a labor union. So um, a lot of the, let me give you a few examples of the stuff we kind of focus on. Misclassification, which is an issue that Mike Sabatoni would be talking about uh, from the building trades perspective at a lot more uh, detail than I can, but uh, misclassification of employees in the building trades is a huge issue where uh, people are not um, classified as workers and they're allowed to kind of work in an underground economy where they receive cash or they don't, and they don't pay taxes. There's a lot of ways that the state loses money and other workers are disenfranchised because these folks can come in and work for less money than, than uh, both labor, labor construction workers and non-labor construction workers kind of cheated out of a lot of jobs. Um, prevailing wage is another uh, a huge concern for the building trades where uh, people working in, in the industry should be getting paid uh, the prevailing wage of what the, um, the job calls for. But a lot of these underground workers are really kind of, kind of underground. And, um, and the reporting is very poor, the re reporting requirements are there, but the follow-up on it through the Labor Board is very poor. Uh, binding arbitration or continuing contract, as Mike talked about, uh, where if a public employee's uh, contract is up, whether you're a teacher or a firefighter or, or um, um, a community um, municipal worker, then there needs to be a way to be able to continue the contract without going on strike and without having people's contracts decimated. Um, collective bargaining rights, privatization, something else that uh, Mike already talked about. Uh, teacher evaluation, high stakes testing, a lot of stuff that you hear about in the newspaper um, recently. So we give a lot of thought about what's going on, how to go forward, quite frankly, in, at the AFL-CIO. We talk about things that, that we're doing and what we can do better with it. And a lot of that is, is talking about lobbying, for instance, not just for labor people, but we're kind of the people's lobbyist. We're not just for workers either, but for all the citizens of Rhode Island. So we, we are working very heavily on a lot of things that wouldn't be considered traditional labor um, issues. 
um, uh, marriage equality, um, minimum wage, homelessness, for instance, ban the box, which is a bill that's been put in to help people in get, get jobs, get one step closer to getting jobs after they've been imprisoned. When they come out, they wouldn't have to check that little box that says, yes, I've been a felon and I've been in prison. Not to say they wouldn't have to disclose that in an interview, but that would just at least get them to the point where they could get an interview for a job. Uh, just cause, right to rent is some legislation that we think is very important where if you're a, re a renter in a home that gets foreclosed on and uh, you're paying your rent and you're doing everything you need to to stay in your home, all of a sudden the, the uh, house you're getting your living in gets foreclosed upon, then um, you get whatever 10 days notice I think it is that you have to be out. So from the teachers <coughs> union's perspective, that was a real problem because we talk constantly about um, how to keep kids in school. And can you imagine the devastation to a family or to a student, to a classroom even, when a student just gets uprooted for no fault of their own or their parents that they just get uprooted and sometimes they have to either just move away to another school system or they go to Grammy's house and pretend they're still in the system so they don't have to change schools. So, so that's another way we found that we could bring our voice to immigration reform, I think is a good example. Well, we think that um, there's a lot to be said for putting people on the books. And I think that's how we look at it, immigration reform, that we can get people come out of the shadows. We will know who people are. They'll be registered. They'll have a pathway to citizenship and, um, and have to take certain steps to get to full citizenship. And uh, we think that's a, a kind of a, a good way for us to be, the voice of people who are otherwise quite voiceless out there, to tell you the truth. So I wish Mike was here so he could talk a lot about the unemployment in, building trade, in the building trades, which is still you know, um, over 40%, because although by all degrees the economy is returning to a good place, it's still very slow, slower here in Rhode Island than other places. And um, it's going to take a little while before we start maybe building some schools or building some hospitals or doing all of the kind of things that we need, large-scale building um, infrastructure, for instance, to put the, um, the building trades folks back to work. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing, rolling forward. It seems to me that uh, part of the unemployment problem might be that both of you are doing the work of four or five people, and maybe we <laughs> should uh, uh, get you some reinforcements. But, uh, you know, at my perch uh, down at the University of Rhode Island uh, in front of a classroom where I usually teach labor history or Rhode Island history or other things of that nature, uh, we have what we know as a pendulum effect. And that is the, the, the bottom of that clock swings up and then it swings down and goes the other way. And uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, it's been going in the conservative, uh, anti-union uh, uh, direction. But uh, I perhaps, because I study this all the time, uh, have the uh, ability to look at this in a historical perspective. And that pendulum only goes so far and for so long. And what happens, it reaches a certain point, and then it starts to swing back towards the middle, and then swing back towards the unions and ordinary people once again. And from what I can tell, and again, I'm no soothsayer here, but uh, I think that pendulum has just about reached its pinnacle uh, in its anti-union nature, and is about ready uh, to go the other way. And I, I take that even from what you folks said, because Mike, you mentioned that even in this tough economic times, you're still organizing people. And Maureen, you said uh, in probably the worst political atmosphere we've seen in, in decades, uh, you're still knocking off people who are uh, uh, anti-people and anti-union mm -hmm. and, and getting some good people uh, involved. So uh, I think uh, we may be on the cusp of a, of a new world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about that. I uh, do, Professor, think that we're uh, we have to be, because as I said since till 5, every time I wake up, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy I wake up, but each time I wake <laughs> up, there's something new, uh, and that has to do with taking away a worker's job. So I do agree with you and certainly hope that you're right and that things are changing. And, and I do see that 
you know, in, in some places where we are starting to have workers come to us. I look at it both ways. Where they want to organize, I look at it as maybe they've been pushed around too long and they're tired of it, or maybe, hopefully, they just want a voice, a voice in, the, in the workplace. So I hope that you're right. And uh, Thank you, at man. least this morning I woke up to not bad news, so it's a good day today. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad to see you wake up another day too, Mike, because you're a great Thank advocate you. for working people. Well, uh, Professor, one of the things that uh, we're doing at the AFL-CIO is we're um, going to do um, an event where we will be inviting uh, um, labor leaders and uh, some legislators to talk about ALEC, A-L-E-C, I don't know, I, I'm sure you have heard of it. This is the American Legislative Exchange Council, which has really been, I think they're celebrating their 40th anniversary this year. They're a group of very wealthy, uh, corporations and, and business people who have been pouring money in quite secretly all of these years to, and, and I remember from my college days some 30, 40 years ago, them talking about starving the monster. And we are the monster. You know, the folks that you represent, Michael, are, are, the, are the monster. So they, they talked about not um, supporting financially public services. And if you just do that a little bit every year, a little less, a little less money, then eventually the system are going to collapse because you can't really run group homes or towns and cities or institutions without some financial assistance and public assistance. So uh, we, they, they've been very secret for years and years and recently there have been some ALEC outing as they called it and uh, we're very aware of what's going on. We're very aware of how it's affected us here in Rhode Island. Uh, last year we were very we were successful in up uh, unseating both the senator and the representative who were the ALEC uh, chair people for the state of Rhode Island legislature. And um, so we see that as a good move. And um, although they don't seem to be very active here and we haven't heard of them recruiting new, new legislators to be on their board, we think we want to be very um, aggressive in making sure that doesn't happen again. And we're going to educate everybody about how this has been going on. And it's not just by happenstance that the schools are crumbling and that um, there isn't enough money for the retirement. There isn't enough money for books for school. There isn't enough money for, to train state employees in many cases where they've asked for training. So uh, we're kind of looking forward to that in the next month or so, you'll be hearing about that. Thank you. Uh, one of the things, uh, as an historian, I'm always looking at different uh, uh, epics, and uh, we find that no matter how bad things get for unions, uh, eventually it turns around, and I think uh, even the, the worst critics would say that the economy is finally starting to turn the corner ever so slowly, but at least it's turning. And um, one of the things I try to get, discuss in my classes, particularly when it comes to unions, is that why is it over the course of more than two centuries, going back almost to the American Revolution, uh, have uh, our people uh, always turned to unions, even when they may have uh, lost their jobs or been in tough economic times. And um, one thing I always like to uh, use is a little bit of humor in my class, and I always say to people, well, in tough times and when you don't have a job and you're not getting enough, and of course everyone's been uh, treated so miserably the last 10 or 15 years doing the work of two or three people, you're only gonna put up with that for so long, but who are you gonna call? You're gonna call Ghostbusters? Uh, mm -hmm. Dan Aykroyd gonna mm -hmm. come down and save us? Mm -hmm. uh, last time I saw him, he didn't look in very good shape, so I think people are gonna turn uh, to the very people they've turned to uh, going back to the late 1700s, and that is organized labor, and that's how old we are. Yeah. We're as old as the nation. Yeah. And uh, I think in many ways, uh, people will uh, look to us once again. Uh, we may not have every answer right now or even next year, but we'll find them. And, uh, I think that's why people will return uh, to their traditional uh, spot here in Rhode Island and around the country. Thank you, Professor. I think you're so right. And if I could tell you the little bit of humor I used on that very subject, actually recently I was at a social gathering and somebody asked me what I did and we talked a little bit about unions and he said, you know, I tend to find that unions really aren't as relevant as they once were. And I said, you know what? I'd like to agree with you. I said, but then we'd both be wrong. <laughs> and, and so, and I explained, and we, and we talked a lot about what we talked about here today. 
and um, how, how we've had this race to the bottom for the middle class and the middle class is shrinking and, um, and, and how we have so many, I think we read in the paper recently about how many children in this, just in this state are living in abject poverty and that's because of what's happening and, and how we need to have the unions to fight for all workers again. This was just a, a little taste of uh, what we uh, experienced a few weeks ago when we had even a larger panel. And uh, I might add the audience was comprised not only of labor members, but uh, probably more people from the business community and the Chamber of Commerce uh, than it was of labor. And uh, as I looked around the room, uh, some academics were there as well. And I think everyone was uh, very impressed, not only with your uh, presentations, but uh, Mike Sabatoni as well, because you really have to have a tremendous grasp, and not only of politics, the economy, political science, there are so many things uh, that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I don't think anyone ever gives you credit for it, or at least they don't want to hear about that stuff. In fact, it may intimidate them. Uh, that you know so much uh, about these things that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. So this was just a little uh, summation, and uh, we could probably do some more of this again, and uh, maybe next year we'll have the film crew down at the uh, uh, annual Labor Law Conference and uh, uh, get this firsthand. So I want to thank the both of you uh, for your articulate uh, presentations, and uh, we look forward to doing this again. The final part of this evening's celebration is the awarding of the Institute's prestigious Eagle Awards. This year, three exceptional individuals will join an elite group listed in your program book. Each award winner has distinguished him or herself throughout their working lives as leaders who have demonstrated the highest ideals of leadership in the workplace and in the community. Their merits, as you are about to hear, will make it abundantly clear why each was selected for the honor about to be bestowed upon him. The first Eagle Award will be presented to Big Tim Byrne by handsome Danny Watts. <laughs> Gentlemen, come on up. Tim Byrne started his career as an apprentice in the fall of 1981 after serving a four-year apprenticeship. Tim wasted no time becoming active in his local. He became recording secretary right after becoming a journeyman in 1986, a position he held for 18 years in the local, very proudly. Tim was appointed to the organizer's position in 19. 98. He held that position for a while. While organizing many companies in the 10 years, I know his, his proudest moment and what he looks back on, he organized Delta Mechanical. Delta Mechanical is one of the bigger unionized shops, plumbing and heating, in Rhode Island right now. And, and that is amazing that Tim could accomplish that. Tim served as business agent in Local 51 and in December 2011 became business manager, financial secretary, treasurer. And I've worked with him closely during that time and until present day. And he is somebody that I look up to. He's a mentor for his, his offices, for his members. And his job is to make sure his members have good health care, a pension, um, all the things we strive for so we can take care of our families. And um, I know all the brothers and sisters that are out here tonight, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise the standard of living for everybody, not just a few people here or there, but everybody. Um, OSHA, health care, pensions. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I'll get back to the written speech. Um, <laughs> Tim was instrumental in bringing the Institute of Labor Studies into the Union Hall and offering college classes, making them available for all the members. Like a good leader, he, he not only offered the classes, but he attended them also. Working towards his degree, he's launching a new program for upcoming apprentices 
So when they graduate the apprenticeship, I believe they will get an associate's degree when they graduate. This is the first of its kind in the United Association in the country. And, and I commend Tim for that sort of progressive leadership. At this time, I'm honored to introduce Tim. He's a close friend. He, he's somebody that I need to lean on. And he will steer his members and the building trades and the other people in this area in the right direction. And with that, I'll turn this over to Tim. Thank you. All of our honorees receive citations from the entire congressional delegation, the state senate, as well as the governor. When Bob told me that I'd, I'd be here this evening, um, you know, I asked him, I said, well, would you like me to say a little bit? And he says, yeah, sure, you have the opportunity to say something. <laughs> he may regret that one. <laughs> but seriously, I, I just want to thank Bob and, and all of his, uh, all the people at the Institute for what they do, because they, they, they provide a tremendous benefit for, our, for our all working people, not, not only working, uh, working union people. My brothers and sisters, we're here this evening because we've made a choice in our lives. A choice to work for others in order to provide for ourselves and for our loved ones. But we've also chosen by simply being here to help those that we work with by educating them and educating ourselves. Whether taking English as a second language to better communicate with others, or by simply taking a steward's class to become more knowledgeable about our rights in the workplace, we've taken the first step in obtaining the power to change our lives. It's kind of ironic that we're here this evening on May 9th, which is only five days after the 127th anniversary of the Haymarket Riots of Chicago. Lives that were lost in the quest for an eight-hour day. Working conditions in 1886 were considerably, considered horrendous at, at best, and they held very little concern for safety, which existed, uh, non existed in most workplaces. Pay was very low, benefits were non existent, and the workday was often 10 or 12 hours long, six days a week. Does any of this sound familiar? In many instances, we see our workplace conditions beginning to regress. The eight-hour workday, in many cases, has given way to double and sometimes triple shifts. Mandatory overtime, unobtainable work counts, and younger and younger workers exposed to increasingly more dangerous work environments that have crept their way back into our society. Winston Churchill once said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So in order to avoid repeating events, such as the, 1880, in the 1877 Chicago Battle of the Viaduct, which left 30 people dead, 100 others wounded, or the 1866 Haymarket Riots in Chicago, which took the lives of seven policemen and wounded 67 others, or the 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which cost the lives of 147 women and children. We must continue to educate our members as well as the general public, that unions are needed just as much today as they were 100 years ago. The road that we travel must be paved by the knowledge of these lessons learned. With education, there's knowledge. And in knowledge, there's power. The power to change, the power to help others and ourselves, the power to lead, and the power to determine our own destinies. So once again, I'd like to thank the Institute for this honor tonight. And I'd like to leave you with one thought. Whatever course that you decide upon, there's always someone that'll tell you that you're wrong. There are always difficulties arising which will tempt you to believe that your critics are right, to map out the courage, the course of this action, and to follow it to its end requires education and knowledge and courage. My brothers and sisters, God bless the Union. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision.